Welcome to AP Physics C Mechanics Live Review. I'm Julie Hood from Mast Academy High School in Miami, Florida. And here's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn all about linear momentum and impulse. So we're going to look at relationships between mass and velocity and momentum of moving objects. And we're going to definitely consider quantities of force, uh, the time over which collisions happen, and the way velocity changes using force versus time graphs. Uh, so that'll lead to a change in momentum. And we'll certainly look at nonlinear functions because this is AP Physics C. So we'll look at additionally at velocity in parts of systems after explosions. And of course, in addition to changes in momentum, we'll also consider kinetic energy changes. So I'm going to use a number of multiple choice questions and free response questions from old AP exams. And my suggestion to you you can just Google AP Central Physics C Mechanics Free Response. I know that's a mouthful, but it'll take you to the College Board um, website that houses all the old free response questions back to 1999. You have an opportunity to do a lot of practice. You've got the scoring rubrics there. You can learn a lot of physics, and most importantly, you can learn what is expected on your exam because we're after the five. That's why you're watching this review. So let's go ahead and review. So we're gonna look at momentum. I've got those cute little arrows over the P and the V because they are vectors. Momentum is conserved, very powerful. But you can change momentum if you add an external force, and we call that an impulse, and the symbol for impulse is a J, or you can use the delta P, but if you look at your equation sheet, there will be a J there. Okay, so why don't we warm up? Um, let's consider uh, you've got a big truck and a small car at the starting line of a race. Now they have identical engines, so both the truck and the small car will have the same constant applied force throughout the race. Uh, but after 25 seconds, the small car crosses the finish line. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we've got um, still the big car and the small car, and uh, we wanna know, which vehicle will have the most kinetic energy when it crosses the finish line? Now, I know my students get hung up. Well, we don't know the mass and the velocity and we got to square it. Let's think about what's going on here. We have two cars with the same constant applied force. They have the same engine, but the big truck has more mass. That's why it doesn't win the race. Same force they go the same distance. So when they cross the finish line, the work that's been done on the vehicle is force times distance, which amounts to their change in kinetic energy. So that means even though they finish at different times, they finish with the same kinetic energy. Now, why don't we consider who's got the most momentum when they cross the finish line? They've got the same force but the big truck takes longer to finish the race. And the change in momentum is a force times the change in time. And there's more time tied up in the big truck racing. So the big truck finishes with more momentum. Interesting. Don't you love this? I do. Now, here's the deal. Instead of waiting for him to cross the finish line, let's see what's going on uh, while the race is still happening, say 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. It doesn't really matter, but which vehicle will have the most kinetic energy in the middle of the race? Okay, they've got the same time going on, but 
speak and the same force from the engines, but the small car is going to have the faster speed at 15 seconds. That's why the small car wins the race. So uh, the small car will have gone a further distance since it has a faster velocity, but again, the same force. So work is force times distance, and that amounts in uh, to the change in kinetic energy. So mid-race, the small car will have more kinetic energy than the big truck. And again, let's look at somewhere in the middle of while they're racing and uh, decide which vehicle would have more momentum at that point. Okay, the change in momentum, they start with none because they're not moving, but they have the same force applied to the vehicle because they have the same engine and the same amount of time has transpired when we consider them still racing. So that means they would have the same momentum. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, if one knows only the constant resultant force acting on an object and the time during which this force acts, one can determine the, this was actually a uh, multiple choice question from an old exam from 1993. And we just talked about this at length. We can determine the change in momentum if we know the force and the time during which the force acts. So don't forget now you have 45 minutes for 35 questions. Some are going to be quick. Others you're going to have to put a lot of thought into. But if you start doing lots and lots of calculations, you're probably doing the problem the hard way. So take a deep breath. You can always skip and go back. But make sure you um, pick something. Don't leave any blank. There's no penalty for guessing. Uh, eliminate obvious wrong answers and uh, narrow it down. So now what we have from another exam, uh, we've got a disc of mass M moving horizontally to the right with a speed of V. And both these discs are on a table with basically no friction. Uh, the little mask is, is going faster. So it collides with a second disc that's double its mass and half its speed. Uh, the two discs then stick together and we wanna find the speed of the composite body right after the collision. So this is a job for the conservation of momentum. So initially you had this guy, little m going at V and you also had this guy moving. We have to look at the whole system. Uh, 2m going at V over two. After the collision, they're stuck together. So we have 3m moving at a speed that we want to determine. So we just do a little algebra and we end up with two thirds of the original velocity. So this is a problem from an old, uh, an old way of looking at the uh, AP physics curriculum. And uh, we've got a new one now, it's a bit thicker, but the old ACORN tried and true had a few multiple choice questions as examples for teachers. There are a lot more resources out there like AP Classroom, do as much as you can from there. So here's what we had in this problem. We had this cannon fixed to a small cart and there's a cannonball projectile in the whole um, cart and, and uh, cannon object. And together they are moving to the right at a speed of V. And then all of a sudden the cannon fires the projectile the cannon and the cart come to rest. And what we want to find is the speed of the projectile relative to the ground immediately after it's fired. Okay, we're going to be using this equation and idea a lot today. But once again, this is a job for conservation of momentum. So initially, we had the cannon and cart, big M, 
plus little m, the mass of the projectile. Together, they were moving at a speed of v. Afterwards, big M, the cannon and cart come to rest. And all we have left moving is little m, the projectile, and we want to find the speed of it. Now, the hardest thing about this problem is reading it carefully and making sure we assign the right variables to the right situation. So when we solve for VF, of course, we get B as the answer. Now, all of this that I'm sharing with you today is being recorded, and um, it'll be housed on the College Board's YouTube site. So you can go back and look. You can speed through the um, obvious and easy parts. I hope there are some for you today. And the parts that mm, leave you confused, you can slow down. You can stop and pause. All right, let's do this. Um, now we've got another problem here. The graph above shows the force on an object of mass m as a function of time. And for the interval from zero to four seconds, um, we want to find the total change in momentum. OK, so let's think. What does that mean? The change in momentum is the force times the time. But this force, notice, is variable. It's constant 10 newtons for the first two seconds and then negative 10 newtons for the second 10 seconds. So um, it's really an integral is the area under the curve. So if we just find the area of each of these two rectangles and add them together, we're going to find the change in momentum. OK, the first area, base times height, it's a rectangle, um, 20 Newton seconds. And the second area, don't forget the negative 10 Newtons part. It's under the, under the zero, so it's negative 20 Newton seconds. Add them together, and you get nothing at all. That's right. So the uh, initial force and then the force between two and four cancel each other out. OK, I don't think that was too bad. But we'll look at some other integrals that might be a little more interesting when the force is nonlinear. You have to use calculus. Now, here we have a five kilogram object propelled from rest at time equals zero by some force that's given as a function of time as 0.5 t. And we want to find the speed of the object after four seconds. Again, the change in momentum, initially at zero, is going to amount to the uh, force times the change in time. Now, the change in momentum is mass times the change in velocity. And we are integrating this force function, 1 half t, um, from zero to four seconds. So you simply do the integral, and you'll find out that the final velocity of the object, the final speed is, aha, this is the tricky part. The change in momentum is mass times the change in velocity. So sure, we got a four, and of course, four was one of the choices. Be careful, you have to divide by the mass. The mass is five, kilograms. Four-fifths is 0.8 meters per second. So don't rush through these too much. Answer the question. Read the question carefully. Answer the question. Now here we have a momentum of kt cubed. k is some constant. I don't know what it is. Uh, we want to know what the force causing this motion is. Um, OK, well, if the change in momentum is the integral of force with respect to time, then the force is the derivative of the change in momentum, which is impulse with uh, respect to time. So we simply need to take the derivative of that momentum function that's given. So when you take the derivative of kt cubed, you get 3kt squared. And fortunately, there it is. So A is your answer. OK, now this is where things get interesting. Momentum is a vector. Uh, so you have an object with an initial momentum that's represented by the vector up at the top here. Um, initially, the object is at rest. And then this 
this vector representing another object strikes it and we want to know which of the following sets of vectors may represent the momenta that's plural of the two objects after the collision okay momentum's conserved and it's a vector so here's our initial momentum shown at the top there uh right um right facing arrow of the length given now if we look at A and I add those two vectors together, I essentially get zero. So that can't be right. If I look at choice B and I add those two vectors together, I'm going to get one really long vector and that can't be right. Um, when I add in part C, the left and the right vector, I'm going to get a vector pointing to the left, not to the right, can't be choice. So we're left with E or D. Let's look at D. The way you add vectors uh, is tip to tail, or you draw the parallelogram and draw the, um, you know, one of these uh, diagonals. And that diagonal is not pointing in the correct direction. But if we, so D is not the answer. But if we look at E, adding these vectors tip to tail, I, I get the right answer. Finally, E's your answer here. Don't forget. Momenta, velocity, forces, they're all vectors. So you have to take into account what direction they're going in. So here's another vector momentum problem. We have a ball, two kilograms, colliding with the floor at an angle theta, and it rebounds at the same angle. And we want to know which of these vectors rep could represent the impulse exerted on the ball by the floor. Okay, so here's the initial velocity coming in, and here's the final velocity going out. Now, the impulse is the change in momentum. So we need to find the change in velocity. Accordingly, um, the impulse is going to be in the same direction as VF vector minus VI vector. So, um, I don't know how to subtract vectors, but I know that I can add the negative of a vector. VI, negative VI, they're the same length and they just go in the opposite direction. So now let's add them. Here's VF, here's minus VI, and their sum is um, a vector. And this vector uh, sum is parallel to the impulse, and that's why E is your answer. Now here's two pucks on a frictionless air table and they're about to collide and this particular puck uh, has 1.5 kilograms and it's moving to the right at two meters per second. Here we've got a much bigger puck but moving more slowly. Now after the collision we want to know um, what happens. But first, first part of this question says what is the total kinetic energy of the two puck system before the collision? Well, kinetic energy, I've got some tied up in each of these objects. So I need to take the total kinetic energy, which is just one half mass velocity squared. So the mass velocity squared, the mass of the other guy and um, its velocity squared, we get three and two or five joules. Now you don't expect to have the same amount of kinetic energy after the collision. It's very rare that kinetic energy is conserved, but momentum is always conserved. Linear and um, angular momentum that in a few more days. So uh, the second part of this question says, what's the magnitude of the total momentum of the two puck system after the collision? Well, it better be the same as the two pucks before the collision. So momentum's conserved, but we have a two dimensional system going on. We've got the mass velocity in the, let's say the X direction is horizontal and the Y direction is vertical, just like I've shown it here. So I've got a total of three momenta units in the X and four in the Y. And if we want to find the magnitude of the total momentum, 
Some of you are already seeing, oh, three, four, five triangle. Yes, use Pythagorean's theorem. All of the momenta in the x squared plus the momenta in the y direction squared squared. And there you have five, and that's why C is your answer. OK, enough of multiple choice. Let's uh, practice a problem here. This one is, uh, a well, it is a multiple choice question, but it has to do with explosions. Now, the cool thing about explosions are the force is internal to the system, so momentum will still be conserved. I can provide an impulse if I apply an external force to the system. Yes, I can change momenta. But here, I've got a mass moving at, at speed v sub zero, and it explodes into two pieces. And one of the pieces is two fifths of the original mass, and it moves with half the original speed to the left. This is moving to the right. So be very careful you read that to the left. You're going to need a negative sign. Momentum's conserved again because the force, the explosive force, is internal to the system. Originally, you had M moving at V naught. After the explosion, you had two fifths of the, this total mass moving to the left. That's why the negative sign at half the speed. Now the other piece is has to be the remaining mass, three fifths, and it's moving at a speed. We want to find that speed, Vf. So do some algebra. Oh, goody, the masses um, cancel. And move that negative one fifth over to the left hand side, and you'll get six fifths. Over here, you had three fifths. Do your algebra, and you find that six over three, oh, to V naught. So that speed of the other piece, which happens to be 3 fifths M, is going to move to the right at 2 V naught. All right, here's an, a more um, interesting explosion problem. You have a projectile that happens to be 2 M in mass, and it's fired above the ground with an, an, an initial speed of 24 and a half meters per second at this angle to with respect to the horizontal. Now, when this projectile gets to its um, highest point, it explodes into two pieces of equal mass. One of the pieces falls straight down, and we want to know where the other piece will land with respect to where it was fired. OK. Um, now, if you tracked the center of mass of this original projectile, it has to follow a parabola. So this little, little dashed line is the center of mass. Um, after it explodes up at the top, M falls down. The other M is going to land over here somewhere. Um, OK, so we need to find out, first of all, how uh, how high it goes, what speed it had, you know, projectile motion problems. So the original y, uh, the initial y velocity, we take the velocity and the sign of the angle that we shot it at, and we get 14.7 meters per second. That's, um, then it gets to its highest point where this thing is at rest, correct? So let's see how high it goes. Um, at the top, it's at rest. We use a kinematics expression because the acceleration is just gravity. It's constant. Uh, it, it was fired with a speed of 14.7. We'll treat gravity as 10. Makes uh, calculations a lot easier. And so the um, projectile rises to a height of 10.8 meters, which means using this kinematics equation. Up here, it's got no y velocity. How much time will it take to fall? I'm finding time because in the x direction, the object, sure, it's moving at a constant rate in the x direction, uh, but we need to know how much time it's moving so we can find the total distance. So the total time to fall would be uh, this equation for t, thankfully, v 
the y component of velocity at the top is zero. We don't have to use a quadratic equation. And we find that it takes 1.4 seconds for this mass to fall and hit the ground. OK, so here's our initial velocity again, an angle. So we can find d1. And we want to find where the other fragment lands. So we also have to find d2. Now, the, remember, it's going to take 1.4 seconds for this other fragment to fall. And for seven seconds to rise and um, go d1 horizontally and then d2 horizontally for half the fragment. So the x component of velocity is going to be 19.6, which means in d1 is just going to be distance equals rate times time. There's no acceleration in the x direction. So d1 is 28.8 meters. Now, we have to figure out what velocity this second fragment has after it explodes, because this first fragment falls straight down. This is a job for conservation of momentum. Initially, we had 2m moving at this vx, 19.6. Afterwards, one, half of the mass fell, and the other half traveled at double the speed, so 39.2, which means the d2 here is going to go twice the distance. And uh, when you, where does the other fragment land? Well, d1 plus d2, or 86.4 meters. OK, not so hard, but that's because these are equal masses. One of them fell straight down. But this could get you started thinking about explosions and conservation of momentum. So why don't we practice? Let's look at an old, it's not so old, free response question. This is from the 2001 exam. We've got a motion sensor and a force sensor, and they're recording the motion of a cart along a track. And the cart is given a push, so it moves toward the force sensor, and then it collides with it and turns around and goes backwards. This is an air track, so a, no friction. I'm sure you've seen these in your classroom. Now, here's the velocity time uh, data, and here's the force time data. When the cart first hit the force sensor, was fully pushing, and then the force sensors uh, started pushing it backwards and when it was no longer engaged. And then at that point, it was going backwards. So try to analyze the, this situation and look at the velocity and force versus time data. Uh, from this, we can determine the cart's average acceleration, the magnitude, of uh, the change in the cart's momentum. Ultimately, we can find the mass of the cart and we can determine the energy lost in the collision. Momentum's conserved, but not kinetic energy. So let's get started. Again, here's our setup and here's our data. Now to determine the cart's average acceleration between these times, we don't need the force time information. So what do we have? Well, accelerations change in velocity with time. And initially, um, it looks that this cart started at about 0.22 meters per second. It was moving at a nice constant rate. And then it encountered the force sensor, which slowed it down and then eventually shot it back at moving the other way at a speed of negative 0.18 meters per second. The fact that the speeds aren't the same is your clue that you've lost energy. We'll get to that later in this problem. So you just simply plug in your values and uh, do your algebra, and you find that the acceleration of the cart during this time is negative 10 meters per second squared. Not so bad. When you get a nice clean number like that, leave it alone. You're probably right. So now the next part, determine the magnitude of the change in the cart's momentum. We're going to need to use the force time data for that because the change in momentum is the integral of the force 
with respect to time. Now, I don't have a nice clean force function for all these, um, but you got to remember the integral is the area under the curve. So I could just treat what's nice. They gave me this grid and I can just count boxes. And if you move this piece with that, you've got half plus one plus one plus half. And these two little bits might fill in right here. And these two little might add together. And ultimately, drum roll, you've got about six of these rectangles. And each rectangle has a height of 10 newtons and a base of 0.01 second. So here's our change in momentum, 0.6 newton seconds. Not too bad, area under the curve. Now, how are we gonna use that to determine the mass of the cart? Well, the change in momentum is mass times the change in velocity. And we just found out that the change in momentum is 0.6 Newton seconds. The change in velocity, well, we were given um, these values from the first graph. So the change in velocity was 0.4 meters per second. Don't forget these signs are very important. You end up adding the speeds because they turn around and go the other way. Okay, so solving for mass, change in momentum over change in velocity. Wow, 1.5 kilogram mass cart. Again, nice clean answer, must be right. So how much energy was loss? Well, the loss in energy, we initially had this much kinetic energy. After the collision with the force sensor, we had this much kinetic energy and we simply substitute our numbers in and we find that we get about not very many but 0.012 joules if you want to call it a 12 millijoules that's fine now you might be wondering but what if i pick the wrong velocity what if i uh i didn't count the the squares right to get the correct change in momentum and it led to an incorrect uh cart mass if you know uh, in part D that you're to find the change in kinetic energy. Even if you use, uh, you get a wrong answer. If you've substituted incorrect answers correctly, you can get full credit. So just take a deep breath and move along through these problems. So there's your answer. Let's do another practice problem. This was from a more recent exam, 2015, and you have a small dart launched at 30 degrees uh, at a speed of 10 meters per second. And when it reaches the highest point of its projectile, it's moving horizontally. It collides inelastically with a block that's just hanging there. And we're given the length of the string that it's hanging from. Um, inelastically means the dart sticks to the block and then together they fly up and we're asked to find how high they get and the height will be um, determined by theta here. So um, that's what we have to find. That's our job. We can do it. Okay, so um, actually uh, then the problem goes on to ask if the dart had more mass and it was launched at the same speed and angle, um, what would that do to the angle itself? And ultimately, what's the period of oscillation initially with the smaller dart and afterwards with the bigger dart? And we would have to justify our answer. Let's do that. So here's our our dart getting launched and uh, air resistance is negligible. We know um, the launch angle and the launch speed. And we're told that at its highest point, in other words, uh, VY is zero. We want to find the speed of the dart just before it strikes. So we just need to find the speed, essentially, the in the X direction because at the top of the flight path, there's no speed in the y direction. So we just simply use the initial speed given and the angle given, and we find that it's 8.7 meters per second. Now we're going to use that because um, now we need to find, uh, well, how far horizontally did that dart go between the launching part 
and a point on the floor directly below the block. Well, that's pretty straightforward um, because if we find our, we need to find the time that it spends going the X velocity, but we need to first find um, how long it takes to get to the top. And we can do that by knowing what the initial Y velocity is, five meters per second, and knowing that at the top of the flight path, it has no Y component to the velocity. And that means it took a half a second for the dart to strike the block. And while it was moving it in the horizontal direction at 8.7 meters per second, it moved 4.3 meters. Now we want to know what the speed of the block and dart together are just after the dart strikes. Hey, there's a collision. That means conservation of momentum. Now, initially, the dart had this X component of velocity. After the dart embeds itself or sticks to the block, together they uh, are going to move up. And in order to find out how high they move up, I need to know the velocity, which is the answer to part C. So doing some algebra, substituting our values in, we find that the block dart combo has a speed of 1.44 meters per second. Now that's going to help us determine the angle through which the dart and the block on the string will rise before coming to momentarily to rest. You know, then they're going to swing back and forth like a pendulum. But in the meantime, let's find theta. L is 1.2. Okay, energy is conserved. After this um, dart hits the block, they have a certain speed which gives them kinetic energy. And we're going to take all that kinetic energy and use it to see how high up um, from this initial position this dart block goes. So here's our kinetic energy and here's our poten gravitational potential energy. And we're going to solve for H. And H is going to be about 10.4 centimeters. Now, what do we do with H so we can find theta? Well, we draw a picture. The length of string is L and um, the dart block rise H up, meaning um, this side of this right triangle is L minus H. And uh, it's gonna be the cosine of theta that relate the two sides. So uh, the this side L minus H and the hypotenuse L. And then when you take the inverse sign and substitute your numbers in, you find that it rises, uh, makes an angle of 24 degrees. This technique of finding that angle is used so many times. I, if you're not familiar with it, I suggest you go back and you watch get to slide 40 while I'm doing uh, this calculation and sort out the geometry yourself and have that aha moment. So now the block rises up and it continues to swing as a pendulum. And we want to know the time between when the dart collides with the block and when the block first returns to its initial position. OK, now not going back up and all the way back, but half of a cycle, half the period. We need to find the period. Remember the equation of the period is the length of the string and uh, we've got to know gravity, which we do. And actually we're given all this information. So find the period and hey, 2.17 seconds, that's the period of the entire oscillation. We just want to find the time it takes for the block to go up and come back to where it initially was, not to go all the way back over and come back again. So we're talking half a period or 1.1 second. Read this carefully. If you left your answers 2.17 seconds, I'm sure you'd get some partial credit, but not full credit. And this is a pretty easy question. So go for the five. Now, in a second experiment, they make the dart have more mass. They launch at the same angle, the same speed, and they want to know if theta would be greater than 0.5 
uh, less than or equal to what it was initially. And you don't need to do all the calculations. You could just think about it. Now there's more mass this time. So you're gonna get a larger velocity up here when after you know the, the more massive dart collides with the block, you're gonna have more um, velocity because of more mass and you're going to have therefore a larger angle so that's why the angle will increase again you'll get the larger velocity thinking about momentum's conserved and now they want to know would the period of oscillation increase decrease or stay the same if you use the more massive um, dart well again looking at the equation for um, the period of a pendulum uh, there is no mass the period is mass independent. So the period is not going to change. It'll stay the same. And there you have it. So we've done a lot of well, momentum problems today. Multiple choice, free response. We talked about explosions. What should you take away from this? Well, linear momentum, first of all, at P equals MV, it's conserved. You saw me use that. Um, concept a lot during this time we had together. Uh, but we can, although linear momentum is conserved, we can change momentum by adding an external force that's called impulse. And the impulse will be the area under the force uh, time graph. And likewise, the derivative of the momentum with respect to time will give you the force, just like calculus. And collisions, they often cause kinetic energy loss. What I really want you to think about is when you have a problem, if there's a collision, think about momentum. So go ahead and check out um, past exams, free response questions, scoring rubrics. Again, do this search on AP Central. Also, go ahead and go to your AP classroom and look at AP daily videos uh, in unit four, that's momentum. And Dr. Korsunsky and Ms. Mesner, they do a fabulous job um, teaching you about the basics of momentum. So go ahead and review those as well. And I want you to come back Monday and I'll be reviewing torque and rotational kinematics everybody's favorite certainly mine in the meantime thank you so much for joining me today <laughs>